Welcome to NetLife with Dawn Staley. Thank you again for listening and being a part of the NetLife fan. This week, I have a really great interview with retired General Marty Dempsey, the chairperson of USA Basketball's Board of Directors. But before that, I would love to welcome my former teammate, my longtime friend, my, I call her Bone, short for T-Bone, I call it something else, but I really can't say that on air right now. Um, but my friend, Teresa Edwards, we're going to talk some hoops. Teresa is a, a five-time Olympian. Yep, four-time gold medalist, a basketball Hall of Fame, er, and has her number retired by those Georgia Bulldogs. Boom. Welcome to NetLife. Thank you, Dawn. Thanks for having me. Anything you're doing, girl, you know I'm trying to be a part of it. Thank you. I, this is awesome. <laughs> can't even believe we get a chance to sit here and chat like this, though, you know, kind of like, uh, ooh, I got to watch what I say because we kind of, you know, it's been a lot of years of talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bong, you, you, you know, before we, we came, on the, came on the air, you talked about how much you've, uh, I mean, you enjoy Lisa's um, appearance on the on that life, and also yeah. Cheryl Swoop's appearance on that life. What what great memories did it bring you to hear us talking about the the good old days of uh, 1995, 96? It's so healing, man. Just to think back, what we had as a family. It feels like a family. It feels like one of those teams that I never go away. First of all, and the fact that. I mean, we have you kind of connecting us all the time because I know that we all come together um, when your games are on in a setting and where we're all sitting there in our different locations and our different environment and just going, you know, feeling, I can feel you in the presence of the 96 team when I watch you coach. So it's, that's how powerful it is. So I think we all feel that. So sitting there watching them reminisce and you guys reminisce about all those days and Carla red big red in the morning and oh my god Cheryl in that mild time that was an Olympic record um my memories goes back to all of that and then I think we all had our own little journey mine was a survival journey <laughs> and had I had not had you guys um my survival and you you guys were so right it's like everyone had this moment where they felt like well at least I know I did and self-admittedly um, that I want, I was like, I cannot believe I am entertaining the thought of quitting for once in my life. So I think, <laughs> I think you and Ruth, that might've been the only ones that didn't because you were able to just go straight in at Tar and like, you could say some things that I wish I could say to Tar, <laughs> you know, my fondest memories, because I'm so competitive was our practices, <clears throat> how we just, we, we just like, man, we, once we got on that court, especially past the warm up nuances, <laughs> and started scrimmaging, Lord have mercy, Jesus, it was on, man, it's the best, it's like dreamland basketball, yeah. where mistakes were minimized, and rarely did anyone really make mistakes, you just had great plays all the time, and we did that in practice, I think that was that, that's really has always been my, like, my place of joy, you know, and yeah. of course, all the times we were able to go out and eat, or you and, you and Lisa trying to cheat on me and treating cards. What was it about our team uh, that made us so special? Gosh, we could say so much that made us special, but I do think you guys cover it very well. I think the indiv individuality was respected from the onset and the passion for the game came together so quick. Um, our true love for what we do was very apparent, especially as we, sh like Lisa said, you guys probably showed up early for the trials, but when we actually made the team, we showed up to practice before Tar got her hand on us. Right. And you know, and I think that really helped set the set the pace. It set the tone for us um, of who we were going to be and what it was going to be like and how we, I don't know, just as humans, we were all good women, you know. And I always tell people we were young ladies, we were young girls turning into women, really, because we were still all pretty much pretty young. I, I mean, Tree and I were the oldies, of course, and we'd done our fair share of playing abroad and being professional and things of that nature. But it was just an amazing group of young women. It was a, I honestly 
got to the point where I didn't want breaks. I didn't want to go home. I, I, that feeling to just be amongst each other in that, in that setting and the hard work that we put into it and we actually saw the results every day, um, the respect we had for that. I mean, don't, don't get it twisted. We fought. I mean, we, <laughs> we fought on that court. I mean, all the practices, all the weightlifting, all the traveling and all that. I mean, if I could do it again, I would do it again. It was a beautiful team. It's a beautiful group of women. I cannot think of a team without thinking of a 96 team. I, I'm really surprised that after five Olympics that that one is that one is the one that I could probably if we said, hey, you know, we want to grow old with a team. That's the team I'm going to grow old with. You know that it was just an amazing group of young ladies. Yeah, the sistership was is 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 definitely real. We, yeah. you know, we we actually respected each other and in, in our space. We, we knew when we needed to back off. We knew when, you know, uh, we knew how to get up under each other's skin. I mean, we really had a great time. I know we talked earlier about um, compartmentalizing. We played a lot of cards. We, Ooh, we played yeah. a lot of cards to get yeah. through. Yeah. Um, and we had, some, we had some knockout drag outs. We used to make <laughs> each other. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this. Right. We used to beat y'all so bad, y'all start cheating. Just tell the truth. <laughs> Please tell the truth for once. Tree and I used to beat y'all so bad. You guys came with signs. With, with, we did. Hey, y'all did it. Oh listen. my God. And it took us a long time to figure it out. Like, oh, there's hey. no way. There's no hey. way. Hey. Oh my if God, I, you and Lisa were if, if either one of us just took our index finger and <laughs> just cool. weighed. That's just, so wrong. Over one eyebrow, that means we got the small joker. If we did That's it with so two, wrong. Two, our index finger and thumb with both eyebrows, that means we got we got the big baby and we got both of them. <laughs> oh my God, y'all cheated bad. One night we went out, we, we left you guys, we were like, because we kicked your butt and you were cheating. And it was like, we still got them. We saw them cheating. This, let's just, don't even tell them. <laughs> oh my God. Now, you know, one thing I really miss, though, is, is um, you remember how you used to bark at me and Tree? Because Tree's a fusser, man. Tree, they don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't know. Tree would fuss at you. Come on, Dawn. Ain't nobody out here for your health. Pass the ball, Dawn. Pass the ball, Tree. Pass the ball, Dawn. <laughs> I ain't running for my health. <laughs> and anytime you saw Tree and I bickering, you would come, come between us barking like a dog. Go, oh, 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 oh. Big dog, big dog fighting. <laughs> I, I couldn't stand you for that. Because hey. tree is hard to get the tree. It's hard to bring her back down when she's up like that. Oh my God. I tell oh. you the, the best, like, like I try to tell our players this, like now, like we got a shot blocking team. So there wasn't anybody best at time and block shots than, than Katrina McClain. Ooh. Tree, tree, you know, she and, and and as competitors, you don't really like to get beat. But when you hear Tree behind you saying, let her go, let her go, let her go, <laughs> let her go, let her go, Dawn, let her go. You Olay and you oh let God. your man go yes. and she smashes it. Oh, my God. And, and her, the joy in it is you're going the other way. It's not yes, even yes, out yes. Of bounds. <laughs> it's not. She's starting to break oh with the block shot. Goodness. Oh, my God. Go, That's, go, that that go, was our entire go. career. That was our yes. entire career. That's it. T, you're, get, you're getting in my way. Just let her go. Let her go. Let her go. Oh, my. That's the most beautiful thing you could ever hear out there. <laughs> um, T, I got a couple more questions. In your tenure on the team, you were able to see a fair amount of staff changes um, and change in leadership um, from above them. From your perspective, um, what kind of impact? the USA basketball leadership have on the team success? Wow. Um, definitely saw a lot of changes, mm -hmm. um, the, a lot of leadership changes. And, and even the fact from going from a player to be a, one of the board members and, and uh, seeing how they did it behind the scenes. And um, the impact was, it, I think that it was, just, it's just very strong. Uh, it's very, uh, it's very, it was very important that the game has always been shifted in the right hands has always been, uh, the history of it has been carried forward. The, uh, the legacy, would you would say, I guess, has gone forward strongly. And, and I think the leadership, you know, even from players like, I mean, I think I stayed around maybe too long, but 
Um, just going from players like myself and Tree to you guys. I mean, I came from the Miller, Cheryl Miller, who's the same age, but Lynette Waters. And, and, and I, I just have to pay homage to it because they, they taught me the value of that on a world stage. And, and I never knew anything was bigger than Georgia at that time. And just the growth of the game and how I, you have to take it and, and carry it with so much honor and pride at the same time. What about you? You know, keep a little bit for yourself as a player is huge. Um, but, but the changes, it's, it's just, to me, has been strong, been beautiful. Um, just to watch, when I first saw Ann Donovan coaching, I'm like, wow, we are really growing. We're, we're giving back to the game now on that stage. And then I saw you coaching. And I'm like, you start to envision all these things for you to be like the Olympic coach, man, that to me, that capped it for me. Um, that just capped it for me. Um, I don't have to watch another Olympics, just watching you uh, in, that, in that position, in that power. And, and the way you carried yourself doing is amazing because that's a lot of pressure. People may not know what's going on in your head because you're representing so much more than the flag sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, you're representing all those players. You're representing so much. There's it. It encompasses so much. Like, as a player, I can only imagine what you felt as a coach. We've gone so far in this game, um, and and I, I think today, if the kids don't look back at the history and how far we've come, it'll go away just that fast as well. But I think there is a lot of power. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of responsibility, accountability to the growth of the women's game. I think it's, it's in a place now where it could easily go backwards and you can't let it. You cannot let it. You can say, okay, that's it. This, these players are retired. These coaches are gone here. Who would be next? But no, it's, that's not how you look at women's basketball on an international scale. You look at it in a way that we have built something that we don't take for granted and we carry it in a way that we want it to always stay this way. Um, and just the people in place, the power that be, have finally given us a little more respect that we deserve once we arrive there as well. I do think there's some, there's got to be somewhat more equity now on that international s- scale that it wasn't there when I was there. And only you can probably help me speak to that for me. Yeah. So, you know, T, uh, <clears throat> I, 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 had a, I had another question, but instead I, I'm just going to give you your flowers because um, you were the leader that allowed me to, champ. to grow. Yeah, champ, champ out here. Champ, hey, is champ. Not, champ, it's not about you, Champ. Right I now. love it's you, champ. champ. I like you, Champ. I like you, too. <laughs> <laughs> but you were the leader that allowed me to grow. Like you were stern, yet you balanced it with, you know, encouragement. You you just had the... the I mean, you, you, you knew the, the pulse of our team. You knew when to push, when to pull. You knew when to, you know, you knew what, what words to say um, that allowed every member of every team that you've been a part of and I've been a part of, that you've been a part of, just grow. And your, your, your legacy of leadership continues. It continued through me and continuing to play on Olympic teams after you. Um, to being an assistant coach on the Olympic team, to being a coach here in South Carolina, to finally being the head coach of an Olympic team. Um, that is because of your legacy, seriously. And I know you're just humble and you don't really, you know, you don't really understand your impact is, is large. It's, it is still, it's still growing. It's a legacy uh-huh. that I will never, ever forget. Like, when anybody, when I talk to anybody, I talk about you because um, you were it. And then you were the leader of our team. Yet in 96, you, you got, you got tested. Ooh. You got, you got tested. And your test was what, what, what made you strong. And in my eyes, um, I know, hell, I can endure anything. Because of what you endured in 1996, um, I I know you got you got to talk about your book because I want to make sure everybody that everybody that has eyes, 
I know you don't got that thing in Braille, but if it was in Braille, you know, <laughs> seriously, seriously, we need we need to know your story because your story isn't told a whole lot. Um, and it needs to be told. And the best person to do that is is you through your book. Can you give us a little bit about your book and and your thoughts on it? Just give us a paraphrase a little bit of it so it entices us to 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 go out and buy it or listen to it. First of all, you give me a little too much credit because Dawn, you work your tail off. You are you set this bar a little bit higher than me. I can I must say that your the, your work ethics, your integrity, and the things you put out into the world right now. I I mean. God knows I'm so proud of you. I, I just, you know, I, just, I, can't, I can't take the credit for that. Um, second of all, um, what I went through in 96 was, you're right, the way I had to carry it and not impart the things that I was going through on my teammates was challenging. That's why it was Black Gold. The title of the book is Black Gold for me because there's a lot of, you know, dark moments that I had to make strong, be strong in. And I really didn't want anyone to know. I think Tree, because he was my roommate, my sister, um, was the only one knew how heavy that low was for me every day, right? And you know, Tree, and you go back to the dorm or room, hotel, wherever we were with Tree. She, you know, I, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do it. I would, I, I would have cursed her out. You know, Tree. You know, she ain't quitting, <laughs> but she would have cursed her out, right? That's what she's telling me. I said, Tree, if I do something like that, you know, I'm gone, right? You know, we, we lived under that pressure bar of what you couldn't do and what what would have, you know, terminate your 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 position on the team a lot. Um, but black gold just gave me an opportunity, really therapeutic Dawn, I, right after that, we wanted to go metal. I sat at the table the next day in my, my dining room and I'm, I'm, I'm writing because I, I'm like having to come down. Now, every time you step off of a gold medal podium, it's like, you got to start over again. Right. And so how do you come down from that high? What we went through in 96 coming down from that took a long time, um, because there's nothing ever equaled that in my life again. But Black Gold was an opportunity. It, it sat in, in boxes for years before I was able to actually get it done. I love the fact that I'm able to use my voice because as I'm like, I'm sitting there talking to you and I'm telling you, I'm recanting the stories, the games. I'm trying not to over, you know, over be, over influx people with basketball games, but I couldn't. There's a way I got to tell the story of how the games went down because I think God created a circumstance for me have to step up and be even stronger. So I didn't know I was that strong. I'll be honest, which I had no idea. I had the strength to endure the things that I did. But I know one thing for sure. I know God and I love basketball. And I just couldn't let anyone take that from me. You, you know, that's the one, those are the things I knew I control. And telling this story has just allowed me to be free myself. Um, and to understand that in the end, Tara and I really are a lot alike. And she wanted the same thing I wanted. I just didn't like the way she went about it when it came to me. And I didn't have to like it. And I can tell, say that out loud. I, I don't have to embrace it because it took us all somewhere successful. It's not always the success. And that approach don't always work for everybody. And as you say, as a coach, you got to figure out every kid and what works for them. And for some reason, you know, I have mad respect for Coach for Tara Vanderveer. She's amazing. Uh, and what she does, and the fact that she is still there doing it is amazing. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, but that experience did something to me. It changed my life forever. And I, even when I talk about it now, I'm doing a really good job with you right now, expressing this, because usually I'm, I'm welling up on the inside going, what the heck, where is this coming from? But I, I think I'm growing past it. I'm, I'm past, what, 50 something, man, headed towards 60. It's crazy. It should, I should still have these emotions, but I think that's what I'm learning that that's how people can truly be impacted in, in their experiences in life. And I can't tell you, I can say, oh, thank you, Tar, or, you know, help me grow and all that. No, no, I, I wouldn't want to re go through those emotions again, but I would go through it again just to be with that team. That's crazy. See that black gold, black yeah. gold, black go check gold, it yeah. out. Yeah. Go check it out. T, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. You know, I love you. We, we, we stay in touch every time that we, we talk. It just feels like we're, we're back in the hotel room in 1996, right. just right. chomping it up. But I, I truly love you. I appreciate you. I thank you. You are, you are, you are a legend in our game that is not often giving your flowers. I hope that 
uh, people will love up on you after they they listen to you and and know that um, a small part of you lives with me every single day as I try to lead young people to a you know a life in which um, you you help provide them in basketball. So it was cool catching up with you. you love you. Love you too, girl. You. Um, always, always. And Absolutely. do well as you're as you're as you're now in this world of coaching. Oh my God, coaching, <laughs> still writing, yeah, doing those things. But yeah, this coaching thing is different. We got to talk more so I don't destroy my girls. <laughs> I'm trying to build them before I kill them. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Bone. Appreciate Josh, you. Thank you, Dwayne. Good luck. Go. Let's go. Let's get this thing now. Before we move to some words from a partner, I just wanted to say something about a groundbreaking NIL deal that our team, our women's basketball team, just signed um, with Under Armour. Under Armour came to our team um, because of um, us being the number one team in the country. And for all the things that we've done throughout this year and prior years in holding women's basketball up to an incredible uh, level, and they wanted to level up um, by signing each and every one of our players. So 16 players signed an NIL deal with Under Armour. Um, it's the first of its kind. And I know people will say, well, um, our team has been doing this and this company and that company, but it hasn't been a shoe company signing every single one of our players. It may be in a company that sells t-shirts. It may be a company that um, just does apparel, but it hasn't been a shoe company. Under Armour decided to do this uh, with our team. I don't know if they'll do it with another team, but this is groundbreaking. This is a huge opportunity for our players to, to uh, lift up their brands, um, it's an opportunity for, for fans to be a part of history um, because everywhere I go, everywhere on social media, all of our, all the people want to know, where can I get a jersey? Where can I get a Leah Boston's jersey? Where can I get Zaya Cooks? Where can I get Dusty Henderson? Where can I get uh, Bree Bills? Where can I get Victoria Saxon? And um, you, you'd be looking for, you know, different companies to see who signed with who, but it's one-stop shopping on the Under Armour website. So I'm so happy that our players got to partner with them. And I hope that other companies, um, really start investing in, in women like Under Armour has with our, with our basketball team. The Beijing Paralympics just came to a close but we're still in awe of these incredible athletes. On the Flame Bears podcast, we hear from Kendall Gretsch and her story prior to the Beijing Paralympics, recounting the moment of her incredible gold medal win and the triumphant feeling of crossing the finish line. What did it feel like when you crossed the finish line? She was literally like, right behind you yeah <laughs> um like what was going through your mind what were you feeling initially i had a moment of panic because right past the finish line there was like a there wasn't a lot of like run out room there's this big like media area where all like camera people were standing and it, it was i mean maybe 10 feet past the finish line and in a racing chair you have a front brake on your front wheel, but it really doesn't work that well. And so we're like barreling towards this finish line. And I was so freaked out about crashing into these camera people right past the finish line. Yeah, that's that crazy. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I like hit my brake a little bit early. And so when oh I gosh, first I panicked, panicked, I panicked because, I was because like, oh, I was no, like, oh no, I hit my brake too early. I knew I had passed her, but I thought maybe she passed me back. So. So yeah, first I panicked that I like messed up the end of the race. Hear more about Kendall's story and her journey to the games, her goals for the future, and more on the Flame Bearers podcast.
The Beijing Paralympics are finally here. While you watch as athletes compete, hear their stories. Listen to top women athletes share their trials and triumphs on the Flame Bears podcast. Stay tuned for more and what's ahead on Flame Bears season two. What's the best workout program? The one that is custom built just for you. Future is the new workout experience that pairs you one-on-one with your own fitness coach. Your coach will map out a plan based on your goals with workouts delivered to your phone each week. Future, your Apple Watch and the app all pair seamlessly so you and your coach can track your progress, celebrate achievements, and keep you accountable every day. Get started right now with 50% off your first three months at tryfuture.com slash netlife. My guest this week is another Hall of Famer. General Marty Dempsey was inducted into the New Jersey Hall of Fame in the public service category in 2020. He served in the Army for 41 years. During his years in the military, he served as the Chief of Staff of the United States Army and as the Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. As Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he was the Senior Officer in the Armed Forces and the Military Advisor to the Secretary of Defense and to the President. General Dempsey is currently serving as the Chairman for USA Basketball, Board of Directors, is a professor, author, public speaker, and who I think is a leader among leaders. General Dempsey, welcome to Night NetLife. Well, it's great to be here, Don, and, and thanks for the kind words, but um, I would actually have said the same of you. I've been very proud to get to know you, not just through USA Basketball, but as a person and as a leader. And So when you asked if I would join you today, I didn't hesitate. <laughs> well, well, thank you. Thank you so much, General. And um, um, our time together with USA Basketball was was one that I'll never forget because um, you you have always put during your tenure our our women's national team at the forefront. Like you 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 came to meetings, you talked, you were very involved in it, and it was a comfort comforting to know that uh, the the top of USA basketball really put women in the forefront. So I have to thank you um, for that. I know. Cheryl Reeve takes over and she will feel the same love as I felt as the head coach of, uh, of our Olympic team. So thank you. Thank you on a lot of fronts. <laughs> no, you're welcome on a lot of fronts. Mm -hmm. So, so general people may be wondering why I have a military general on my podcast, but basketball is a big part of your life. Um, can you talk to me about your relationship with basketball um, when you were introduced to the game? Yeah, I, you know, I, I grew up in Bayonne, New Jersey, and um, and my both my parents worked, and um, my grandmother was a janitor at a local elementary school, and she and she was kind of my caregiver while both my parents worked. My father as a warehouseman, and my mother as a stock shelves in a convenience store. But anyway, my grandmother would take me with her when she would go to work, and what she would do is she would put me in the gym. I think she actually locked me in so I couldn't escape and, you know, left me with a basketball. And so, you know, I mean, I just became fond of the game. And uh, a few years later, I was playing high school ball. Now, by now we had moved to Goshen, up near Goshen, New York. And I got a little scholarship to go to Willis Reed's All-Star Camp in New York Military Academy near West Point. It was right after the Knicks had won the 69 NBA championship. And, and you remember the names, you know, Willis Reed and Dave DeBusher and, and Bill Bradley and others. And, um, and at the camp while I was playing, I kind of tweaked my ankle. So I sat down. It was the day that Bill Bradley was there as the guest speaker. And so I was kind of feeling sorry for myself and watching the game. And next thing I know, I feel this presence sitting next to me. And it was Bill Bradley. And he said, how you doing, young man? I said, you know, I mean, this is like the Pope sitting down next to you. you know? <laughs> and, I, and I said, I'm great. Thanks for asking, Mr. Bradley. And he said, uh, how, 
you know, why are you here? I mean, what's your, what are your goals? And which I thought was really an interesting question. I said, well, look, I, obviously I'd love to play, play basketball at whatever level I could, but I said, you know, you've seen me, you know, when I stand up, you've seen my height, you've seen my, my physicality and you've, and you've seen my vertical leap. You know? And so I said, I think it's going to be, you know, pretty limited, but I, I'm going to love it while I got it. And he said, you know what, that's really, important and he said it sounds to me like you're taking the right things out of the sport you know teamwork and discipline and he said the one thing I he said I've been watching it now I don't know if he was really watching who knows right <laughs> but he said I've been watching you and um you know I you know I don't know whether how far basketball will take it but he said you've got you've got genuine leadership abilities and I was so impressed by that and I was so you know pr proud that he would he would have said that that years later, when I became a general, I actually wrote him a note and said, you know, dear Senator Bradley at the time, um, you know, thanks for inspiring me. And, you know, so that's why I got involved in basketball, because it was um, it, it's really one of our most accessible sports for young men and women. You know, you don't need a whole lot of gear. You know, you know, you, of all, I don't have to tell you about basketball of all people I might <laughs> ever talk to, but I just felt it was a great nurturing experience and um and so when i got the chance to work with commissioner silver with uh, uh the first olympic team i worked with was 2012 and then um subsequently got asked if i'd be part of the program i was just thrilled so 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 general um um he saw some leadership skills in you at, at that age now, I'm, I'm, I, I got a little joke because we, we put on a lot of camps throughout my, my, my coaching career. Yeah. And there's always a few, a few that get hurt and then it's, they're done. They're done for the rest of the camp. And they just really want to, they just want to watch. They just want yeah. to see everybody else. Um, but the fact that someone saw your leadership skills at, at that age, can you, can you tell us what you were doing during the during the camp that someone would actually see that? Yeah, I, I actually was uh, working hard. I mean, especially on defense where, I, you know, where regardless of your of your physical stature, you can make it you can make a real difference on defense. Again, I'm talking to you about a right. sport that you might as well have invented. But anyway, uh, so I was working hard and I was, you know, keeping my spirits and everyone else's spirits around me and you know, I was trying to distribute the ball. You know, I mean, it, but here's the thing that, that struck me was, so he said that. Now, again, I don't know whether he really meant it. Who knows? But think about the power of a role model like that, saying to a young person, man or woman, boy or girl, you know, you've got something in you. Even if you didn't have it before, now you got a shot at getting it. Because now you begin to believe, wow, you know, if Bill Bradley says I, I can be a leader, how can I let them down? You know, it's that kind of, it's yes. that kind of positive. That's why positive reinforcement is just so important. <laughs> it sure is. That's a, that's a great story. That's a great story. And, uh, um, I, 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 in, in coaching, you, you utilize a little bit of that where you, you, you take an opportunity to impact no matter how big or small, like you became yep. a, a general, um, and you remember that story when you were a little boy. And it, it, it stays with you. And I'm sure you, you know, you have been examples for me um, in, a, in a leadership position. So you are passing it on, whether you are consciously thinking about that or not. It is you, you feel your presence. So, you know, thanks for sharing that story. But you've been you've been really involved with programs that bring together service me members and their families with athletes, specifically basketball. Can you talk a little bit about the value you see in bridging these these two worlds? Yeah, I can. Um, first of all, my motivation was in, I mean, one of the things that senior military leaders really have to pay attention to is how well connected or not we are with, with our fellow citizens, you know, and because it's an all volunteer force, um, you know, those that choose to serve do, and thank God that we have them. And they're really a wonderful group from all across the country. And when we get a high quality kid, American sons and daughters, but we have to be really careful to, to really work to stay connected with the rest of America. 
And so, meaning the ones that didn't choose to serve. And so, you know, it occurred to me that sports would be a great way of doing that, you know? And, and it, by the way, at some points we were criticized, I was criticized for just trying to use the connection as a recruiting, you know, uh, trick. It had nothing to do with that. It was, how do you take the best athletes in the world? And I really do believe basketball players are the best athletes in the world. And how do you, in our, and at least ours are. And so how do you take the best athletes in the world and connect them with the best military in the world so that they learn from each other, number one, and, but also that the rest of the country sees the military in a different light, interacting with these highly elite athletes. And I think it made a difference to the athletes and I know it made a difference uh, to our men and women in uniform. And then we included the families because one of the things about an all volunteer military is we say, you recruit a soldier, but you retain a family. So you recruit a soldier when he's 18, 19, she's 18, 19, 20 years old. But when it comes time for that first enlistment period to end, they will only stay if they feel like you, you also value their family. And so it all kind of really worked well. And I, I'm really, ha and it, it's, still, it's still ongoing, by the way. Every franchise in the NBA and most colleges have some relationship with the military. That's awesome. You recruit a soldier, but you retain a family. I, I'm mm -hmm. actually going to use that in recruiting because yeah. that's exactly what we do. That's, ex that's exactly what we do. So yeah. I, uh, if any of our, uh, our, um, our future, you know, recruits, if I come into your home and you hear that, you know, you know, it's <laughs> stolen, it's recycled from, a, from the general. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you, General, can you talk a little bit about the partnership that the, the NBA and the De Department of Defense started during your time as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff? Yeah, I can. And here I have to give a lot of credit to somebody you know and love, just as I do, is Kim Bahuni, who is the NBA Senior Vice President for International Player Development. And what she has, uh, you know, her, her superpower, you know, we always talk about superpowers. What's your superpower? Kim Bahuni's superpower is connecting people. She is absolutely, in my view, uh, unparalleled in her ability to, you know, to take people from different you know, backgrounds and walks of life and connect them. And she came to me when I was the chief of staff of the Army. And she said, you know, we really, not, mind you, the, the country had been at war for about 10 years at that point. Little did we know it'd be another 10 after that. But she came to me and said, you know, we really want to do something to connect the NBA with uh, the military. And so, and, and she didn't have any exact ideas, but she had an open mind and a blank sheet of paper and a whole bunch of resources that she was willing to throw at it. And so the very first thing was a thing called Hoops for Troops. I don't know if you remember that. I do. Pardon me. And Hoops for Troops would be days during the year uh, in both the NBA and the WNBA where the, the franchise would invite the military you know, to be recognized at the event. And um, the, my favorite part of it, back to families, was they had a thing, they designed a thing called Anthem Buddies. And so during the National Anthem, you'd have these little four and five-year-olds standing, you know, in front of, um, you know, these seven-foot-tall elite athletes. And it was just really quite remarkable. But Hoops for Troops was franchises in the NBA um, reaching out. And I was pushing the military bases near the franchises to reach the other way. And then just, you know, do things, invite them, invite the athletes to the base to see what the military does. And then the NBA and WNBA would invite the military to see what they do. Nothing more than a casual relationship. And then um, Kim said, all right, I think this was actually my idea. I don't normally take credit for it, but I said, you know, Kim, this shouldn't just be a one way street. And, one of the things I was trying to do with the military was make them feel the privilege of serving in the military. So I didn't want it to, for them to get the idea that they were somehow entitled. They needed to be prepared to give back to their communities in a really sincere and powerful way. And Kim said, you know, we ought to do the same thing with the 
with NBA franchises. So we came up with a thing called commitment to service. And generally it, it happens during the week right before Veterans Day in November. And soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and, and NBA and WNBA athletes, you know, do something for the community. We don't care what it is, you know, fill food baskets or, you know, work on, um, you know, helping build. We went to Africa together and, and built some, uh, some uh, homes. Uh, they, I mean, they were just so modest, it's even hard to call them homes. You know, in, in some of the, the really the places in, in and around Johannesburg, for example, that are just horribly underserved as communities. And anyway, so we got them doing those kind of things together and called that commitment to service. And meaning, you know, we're we are really blessed. That's that's to say these athletes and we as the United States military are really blessed. So let's think about how we should you know, give back because because we're so blessed. And it's kind of been an evolving thing. It hasn't stayed any one thing. And um, and sometimes it, it's it works better than others, you know, depending on. You know, have, you know, COVID has kind of been a pain in everybody's backside, you know, as we're trying to do anything. And, um, but that's the kind of thing we try to do with the NBA. Cool, cool. Now I'm, I'm going to go off to topic a little bit because I think this is kind of um, uh, something that, that uh, you and I had this discussion um, during, last year during uh, a time in which our country was, in an uproar, and it still is with uh, yeah. some social justice things and how, how, for example, our our South Carolina women's basketball chose to peace, peacefully protest um, during the national anthems during our games. Right. Um, and, and and you sent me something. You sent me a, you know a, a, an email. I read it. Right. And I was like, you know, I never I never thought about it this way. Um, and I did share it with our team during that time. And if you can just kind of share um, what that email was about in, in regards to um, the the 90 seconds, you call it the 90 seconds that yeah. that that the, the national anthem is being played or saying or or um, or or being used in a, in, in a sporting event. So if you can share that, I think our listeners will really um, enjoy it like, as much as I enjoyed it. Yeah, well, thanks for bringing it up. And by the way, thank you for that exchange when, when it happened, because you know most people are so, and I really mean this when I say most, unfortunately, most people have such a, uh, you know, believe it, that it's black and white, either do it or you don't do it, and anything not just, you know, the national anthem and other rituals. It's just, you know, they, the, they, the, the ability of people these days to be absolutely convinced that there's only one way to do it is really kind of remarkable. And it's not a good thing, actually. And so when this happened, I wrote a, uh, an essay, really, and I published it in Atlantic Magazine. And what I was trying to do is just encourage people to think about wh why the national anthem and the ritual of standing for it, because it's really a ritual. And it only goes, by the way, it only goes back to right after World War II. It doesn't go back into our history. It's just really right after World War II. I mean, the first time it occurred was in the 1919 World Series, but then it kind of languished. And after World War II, in a wave of patriotic feeling, people started, every you know, sports uh, started to play it and people started to stand. And so that's where it goes back to. And it does happen to be unique to sports. I mean, think if you didn't hear the national anthem at a sporting event, you'd be hard pressed to say where you'd ever hear it. it whether it, is, it was intended to be inextricably woven with sports, it just happened to be. And it's, it's what it is. And I felt in my essay that I shared with you, two things. One, I completely understand why people um, who, who weren't enjoying the same justice and equality in our country, why they would feel that, um, that the country, you know, that this ritual of the national anthem, that they were being left out of the life in our country and therefore that the ritual had less meaning. And so I completely understood in those moments, especially in the heat of those moments, 
understandable heat of those moments when you know we had these horrible murders and and all the things that, as you said, that still go on to this day, why they would decide they didn't want to take part in that ritual. I completely understood it, as I said that to you. But I said, I hope that doesn't become the new normal. This is what I said to you, but I'm sharing it because you asked me to on this podcast. I hope it doesn't become the new normal, meaning we're never happy with what's going on in the country, because then what happens is that the ritual will be stolen. Think about that, that, that people who are, you know, living the life they want to live in this country, they will essentially make the anthem, make the ritual their own. And then what happens is the ritual becomes just another thing pulling us apart. And so what I suggested in the, in the article that I wrote, the essay, was, first of all, let's think about what the, the anthem actually means. Think about that it is a ritual. It's 90 seconds. And if, if that ritual could be used, if we could figure out a way to use that ritual to think about the things that, that join us and unite us and could bring us together, then we've got 23 hours, uh, 58 minutes and 30 seconds to beat the hell out of each other, the way we do, by the way, in the rest of the day. And that's, that was what I said. I, I said, look, I understand. I really do. I'm not trying to, I'm, and I'm not, I'm not trying to talk you into out or anything. I'm not you personally. I'm just saying right. when I wrote mm-hmm. the article, I said, I'm not trying to talk anybody into or out of anything, but I really am encouraging people to think about it. Because if we lose our rituals in this, rituals are, you know, they're just that. You know, r- religion is built on rituals. So if you're a person of faith, the way that that faith exists over time and reinforces is through a ritual. It is. And that's also true of patriotism. And it can be hijacked. So can religion, by the way. Religion can be hijacked to extremism. And a ritual can be hijacked. A patriotic ritual can be hijacked. And really what I was saying is let's not let that happen. So anyway. That powerful, was- powerful, powerful. I, I, I did share it with our team. And um, I, I told them this is, I, I've, never, um, I've never had it presented in that way. Um, and... They, they continue to do what they did, but I'm sure it added a different perspective on things. And, um, and that's, you know, that's all we can do is that's right. sh- share information, give people a different perspective on things and, and still allow people to make their own decisions. Yep. Um, but this, you know, this is a space in which, you know, I, I try to impact our, our young people in a way that, um, that give, that give them perspective, but not, make decisions for them so yeah you don't give them the answer right right so thank you thank you i have to tell you for those listening if you don't follow dawn staley on twitter you're missing out (laughs) no really i mean i i do and i don't follow a lot of people on twitter i hardly even follow myself but I, i certainly don't follow a lot of people but i do follow you and here's what i find about you dawn and i know you didn't have me on to make this a you know a mutual admiration society but But I will say this, I think the best leaders I've been around, I would describe them as sense makers. They help people understand because they help make sense of things. And again, they don't give them the answer, but they help, they just help give context, give knowledge, you know, give a, be a listener and then help them make sense of it. And then people make their own decisions. You know, in my heart, I still have, you know, this relentless optimism about people. And so if you can find leaders who are sense makers, I just think those are the ones you ought to flock to. A, a, a nugget that I just wrote down. I always keep a pen and paper um, when, when I'm on these podcasts because I'm I'm forever learning. And the more you learn, the more you can share, uh, the more you can give perspective on things. So thank you. Leaders are uh, sense makers. That's, that's so true. That's so true. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to switch topics a little bit, but okay. I, I, I mentioned this in the introduction, you are on USA Basketball's board of directors, and I want to talk a little bit about that. What, what does that board do, and what role do you play as the chairperson? Well, the, the USA Basketball is one of 47 national governing bodies for Olympic sports, fundamentally. and. Um, and 
in that regard, we're independent, an independent entity. We're a nonprofit, an independent entity, but we have authority to establish standards for um, youth basketball actually across the country. Uh, and, and we are accountable, but, but not a subset of the US Olympic and, Param and Paralympic Committee. So USOPC has been empowered by the Congress to provide oversight of every national governing body. And that power has increased and, and needed to after the USA Gymnastics and the Larry Nassar scandal. But USOPC has um, oversight of all the national governing bodies. So one of my jobs is to make sure we're in compliance. The second, the second job is to make sure we're living up to our mission. And our mission is to field teams at under 16, under 18, under 19, uh, under 23, uh, the Pan Am Games and the Olympic Games. We field international teams, men and women, and we field uh, three on three and five on five. So there's always, you know, right now in Washington, DC, we're in a qualifier for the Women's World Cup, which will be in Australia in September. There's always something going on. I don't pick the teams. Um, I have a hand in selecting the coaches because one of my jobs is to make sure we're getting coaches, the kind of coaches that we want to represent the richness and diversity and, and, and character of our country. And so I have a, I pay particular attention to the coaches we pick. And then the other part of our mission is not only to field teams, but to make sure that the teams, and you, you understand this better than anybody, but make sure the teams understand that clearly we want to win a gold medal. If, if somebody's keeping score, we want to win. I mean, it's as simple as that. But that how we win is just as important. You know, we don't want to go overseas and, you know, blow everybody away and, and, and exhibit an arrogance and, a, you know, and, and anything that would diminish the role of sports. And I really believe sports, you know, I said that I, I watch out for rituals, but I also think if anything is going to bring this crazy world together, it'll probably be sports. Um, and so I'm very passionate about that. Now, the, the only other thing I'll say is every chairman brings to the job his own particular points of emphasis. It doesn't mean the whole organization rolls over and plays dead, but every, every chairman brings a point or two of emphasis. And mine are women in sport and uh, youth development. So, you know, I, obviously I'm, I'm worried about you know, Kevin Durant and Steph Curry and James Harden and, and you know, Don, I'm worried, and, and Sue Bird and Diana Trazzi and Bree. I'm worried about all them. But what I really want to know is what are we doing to make sure that we, the next generation and the generation after that, that everybody has a, uh, the same chance to excel through sports and that we're imparting kind of a culture of USA basketball, a culture of inclusiveness, a culture of of excellence, a culture of character. Anyway, that's, so that's what we do. And, you know, I, I, fortunately, uh, you know, obviously I should have worn my, you probably have one of the shirts. You may have designed it, but that shirt that says <laughs> greatest dynasty ever. Yeah, I had one. <laughs> I love that. That's my favorite shirt. I got to watch that I don't wear it too much, but I got to wear it out. But, you know, seven gold medals in a row for our women's Olympic basketball team. And, um, obviously I don't want to be the chairman where, you know, we got to start over with a new shirt, you know, like one in a row. So, <laughs> right. um, but it, you know, it's not just that, and maybe that's the bigger point here. And fortunately the culture of USA basketball has been quite remarkable long before I became part of it. I'm just, and I'm, we're looking ahead to 2028 already. We're not overlooking uh -huh. 2024, but you know, you got to build the bench of coaches. You got to build the, you know, you got to see the players, you got to encourage them, you got to make them understand, you know, when they wear the USA, it's different than if they wear South Carolina or Duke on their jersey. And so um, <clears throat> it's, it's just a whole lot of fun. So, so what is your favorite part of the work you do with USA Basketball? Well, my favorite part is interacting with the coaches and players because, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> that's the part everybody, by the way, they'll say, you know, I'll what do you do for a living in, in, in retirement from the military? Well, I'm the chairman of USA Basketball. Oh, that must be really cool talking to, you know, Don Staley and Greg Popovich. And, you know, and I said, yeah, that, that is cool. And then I love that. I mean, it, how could you not? And, you know, the legends of the game in our time. Um, 
but truthfully, the part that I feel most reward, I, you know, obviously when I see you standing on the metal stand, that's incredibly rewarding. But, but I also, it's almost like the, the analogy of the, you know, they talk about the duck on the pond, you know, the duck looks like it's just kind of cruising and underneath it's working. It's, you know, it's, it's little web feet off. And that's the part of USA basketball that I actually find most rewarding is the part where nobody knows what you do, but your little web feet are just crushing it under the water to make sure that when we get to Paris, you know, we got the right people in place. And by the way, there's fiduciary, you know, monetary responsibilities too, with, you know, sponsorships. And, and by the way, and this, you'll appreciate this. I mean, you know, making sure that, you know, as things as simple as if, if the men's, you know, workout facility in Las Vegas looks like this, then the women's workout facility in Vegas is going to look like this. You know, we're not going to have this, this kind of, um, uh, you know, revenue doesn't drive everything and it shouldn't, especially in a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. So as a respected military official, you represent the United States on the world stage. What does this mean for you and what advice uh, do you share with the, the athletes representing our country? Boy, that's a that is such a great point, and 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 I it's actually quite um, simple, but it's profound. You know, it's one of those things that it's simple to say, but we have to kind of you have to kind of let the meaning wash over you. And one of the things that is a reality in our country is you you know we talked about it a little earlier is we're probably um, we're we're probably more polarized in our in our views. Notice I didn't say divided. I hate to say that we're divided because I do think, you know, I do think there are still things that unite us. And, you know, we really need to, in my judgment, we need to pay more attention to those. But we are polarized in our thinking, you know, about, you know, the distribution of wealth, about social justice. We're, we're just polarized about, about things. And what I tell our athletes is that when they put on that USA, Regardless of where they come from, they are they represent the whole country, the part that they agree with and the part that they disagree with. And that doesn't mean, by the way, that they have to condone, you know, or or in some way suppress their concerns about things like social justice. But it does mean that they need to come together as a team in a way that will hopefully encourage the kind of, you know, a move back from that polarization for whatever period of time they're on the world stage. And then the other thing is, you know, like no other nation, we own the sport of basketball. We own it because we invented it, even though the Canadians always give us a bunch of baloney about that they, that Naismith was a Canadian. <laughs> and, but we, you know, look, we, we have had success in basketball like no other country on earth. So in, in a real way, we own it. And what that means is, that we have to take responsibility for the game, for what it stands for, for the, you know, the, the discipline, teamwork, sportswork, and character that can come from it. And so it's the combination of those two things. This is what it means to wear USA. And secondly, you really own the game in, a, in an important way. And how do you want to leave it? You know, how do you want to leave the game after your time, you know, in the arena? So that's the kind of things we talk about. 41 years in the army thank you for your service um, first off and um, I just want to talk a little bit more about your your military career and also your leadership mm -hmm. um, why was a career in you know in the army important to you to be honest it, w it wasn't I I didn't I didn't want it I went to West Point and and showed up there in June of, of 1970 and um, I, there was probably no one more surprised than me that I was there. I didn't, I had no intention of going to West Point. I had, uh, I mean, remember uh, my senior year in high school was 1969 and you're too young to remember, but hopefully some of your listeners are not, but that was a really rough year. And, uh, you know, we've had our share of rough years in American history and that was one of them. And it was, again, we had a, a terribly polarized political uh, environment. Uh, the Vietnam War had gone badly and it was ending badly. 
and uh, and the casualties were just horrific. And so, you know, not that I was, I, you know, that was back in the days of the draft, and I, my draft number happened to be pulled high, and so I, there was no risk of me being, um, you know, me being drafted, you know, because my number was so high. There was a selective service merit, not merit, but a lottery system. So I didn't, I didn't have to go in the military. And so I thought, well, if I don't have to, I'm not going to. And then my mother, it was my mother actually, Don, and she said, you know, uh, we come from rather humble beginnings and, um, you know, second generation, I'm a second generation Irish immigrant on all four grandparents. And she said, do you realize what an opportunity this is for you to, to be able to make a difference, not just in the military, but with that West Point education to do something really important with your life. And I thought, hey, mom, come on, I'm 18. You know, I, for me, making a difference is seeing if I can back the car out of the driveway without, you know, <laughs> crashing. So anyway, but she eventually broke down in tears and I thought, oh my God, I'm going to West Point. And so off I go. But what happened, Dawn, is when you get there, and this is not, this is not unique to West Point, but I think West Point really focuses on it. Um, you you get introduced to the important the importance of individual excellence, but in the context of a team. So, you know, West Point wants you to be the number one cadet in the class, but they want you to be part of a team that's going to go out and lead the army, you know, into into the future. And that was really uh, powerful to me, and and because I really loved the idea of of individual excellence in the context of team. I mean, it's the same thing you do. You recruit some five-star athlete and you want them to bring that, you know, their, they, you want them to bring their confidence, their skill, but you want it to be manifest in the context of the team. And that's exactly what the army does. And I found it to be pretty remarkable. And then the second thing was um, I just fell in love with leadership. I mean, I love the idea of taking people over time, this is, of taking a group of people from you know so many different backgrounds and beliefs and trying to get them you know to uh, move toward a common goal and and so uh, the, it was the leadership experience that kept me going and I didn't leave till they told me I was done so <laughs> so do you I mean th throughout your, your your 41 years um, does it does it take uh, a special motivation or characteristics to to serve in the in the armed forces yeah I, I think it does Don but uh, but this you know this is almost one of those nature or nurture arguments you know are are leaders born or are they made and I don't first of all I don't think they're born I think you know their upbringing their parents you know their teachers their coaches all have a role in that um I, I do think then what kicks in at some point is individual motivation. You know, you can't, you know, in your, in your line of work, you'd say you can't teach height and you probably can't teach motivation. You know, it's, that engine has got to be there. What you do is you kind of rev it up for them, but they've got to have that engine. And, um, and that's kind of the same thing I, I think uh, that I found in the military, but I will tell you, just as we mentioned earlier on how the, the power of positive reinforcement. I, ha I've, I haven't run into many soldiers in my life, and I, or sailors and Marines and airmen for that matter, who if given the chance, don't become better than they think they can be. I certainly became a better leader than I ever thought I could. But it was partly because I was interested in trying. And secondly, I had mentors, you know, who were uh, honest enough with me to point out, you know, where I, I was on the right track and where maybe I, I wasn't, but they, and they were able to do it in a way that, you know, that encouraged me rather than discouraged me. So, you know, it is, it is a bit of nurture, a nature and a bit of nurture, I think, it's, but that's what makes it exciting. I'm excited to share more about Flame Bearers, one of my new favorite podcasts on Flame Bearers, top women Olympic and Paralympic athletes from around the world, like USA Soccer's Becky Sauerbrunn and Nigerian hoop star Azene Kalu Phelps, share their rarely heard stories and their full selves. Hear directly from the masters of grit and resilient to learn more about the issues 
that matter most to them and how they've been able to overcome obstacle after obstacle. Season two is live now and Flame Bearers is spotlighting the women athletes blazing a trail to Beijing, including U.S. figure skater Brady Tennell, ROC's Oksana Abdekarmanova, and many more. When you watch them compete in February and March, you'll see what they've worked so hard to achieve. But first, hear from them what happens when the cameras are off and stadiums are silent. During these challenging times, these women are an endless source of hope and inspiration. Our next partner has a product I use literally every day. In just a few short weeks of adding Athletic Greens to my daily routine, I was fully bought into the hype. Before Athletic Greens, I felt like I had to take so many different supplements to just get the daily nutrition I needed. It was hard to create and sustain any kind of routine, especially how much I'm on the move. Now, I have my bag at home and take my travel packs on the go. No matter where I am, I shake it up, drink it first thing in the morning, and start my day the right way. Right now, it's time to prioritize your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. I love the peace of mind it gives me. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash net. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash N-E-T to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. What's the best workout program? The one that is custom built just for you. Future is the new workout experience that pairs you one-on-one -on -one with your own fitness coach. Your coach will map out a plan based on your goals with workouts delivered to your phone each week. Future, your Apple Watch and the app all pair seamlessly so you and your coach can track your progress, celebrate achievements, and keep you accountable every day. Get started right now with 50% off your first three months at tryfuture.com slash netlife. Have you ever heard of recovery footwear or active recovery? I had neither until a fellow coach gifted me a pair of UFOs. And let me tell you, they have become my habit. I keep a pair everywhere, at home, in my office, in my locker, everywhere. As a former athlete, I still work out. It's tough to turn that off, but I also have to get my boy Champ his exercise. And of course, coaching is super active. So I'm constantly on the move. My UFOs help me feel so much better throughout the day, no matter how much I have going on. UFOs uses a unique foam material called UFOM TM that absorbs impact so your body doesn't have to. You know, the journey that leads you to success is filled with adversity that can knock you off your path. But the resilience to sustain that success starts with active recovery and UFOs. Check out all the different styles, each with the same foam technology and footbed on UFOs.com. They changed my life and I think they could do the same for you. Osa mimosas are a drink I recently discovered. Their canned mimosas come in four delicious flavors like classic orange, peach bellini, mango, and my personal favorite, cranberry mimosa. They're made with premium sparkling wine, 100% real fruit juice, and contain 80% less sugar and 60% fewer calories than typical mimosas. But the best part is they're always ready to go, which means zero prep and most importantly, zero mess. Right now, Osa is partnering with NetLife to give our listeners a free four-pack of their best-selling classic mimosas with any purchase over $29. Simply add items to your cart and they'll automatically add a free four-pack to your order once your cart reaches $29 or more. Do yourself a favor and grab some delicious mimosas at osamimosas.com slash JWS. That's O H 
zamimosas.com slash JWS. If our listeners are, are enjoying uh, this podcast, um, there's more to uh, to general. He's written uh, he's written two books on, on leadership, two books on leadership. Go check them out. I have uh, an autographed copy um, <laughs> of the latest. Thank you, thank you, General, for that. But what is the biggest lesson you learned about leadership that applies to all areas of life? Well. You know that's a that's a. We, this probably could have been your first question, and we'd have, we'd have probably consumed all of the available time. Um, I can't say one thing because I, I don't think there is one thing. And in, in fact, I, actually, the the leaders I've seen that that you know, you ever see the movie City Slickers? Uh, I, it was I have a, at it, one point. It's a 1980s cowboy spoof with Billy Crystal and Jack Palance. Jack Palance is this old grizzled trail hand and scares the heck out of Billy Crystal. But finally, Billy Crystal gets, it's on a, you know, uh, uh, you know, he goes to one of these dude ranch experiences. And he says to Jack Palance, this grizzled old cow hand, you know, what's the secret of life? Because he's struggling. He's having a midlife crisis. And, things. and Jack Palance holds up this crooked old finger and says, you have to figure out what, what's the one thing. You know, and that's all he says. And then Billy Crystal spends the rest of the movie trying to figure that out. But in some ways, that's really true. What is the one thing in your life that motivates you? And it may not be just one thing, but but it, it but that's a good way to at least start the conversation with yourself. And for me, I always felt like the one thing for me was I wanted to make the people around me better, better than they probably thought they could be. Which really, you know, maybe going back to that Bill Bradley thing, maybe that's what he was saying. He could be my Jack Palance, you know, mm-hmm. and because if you there's other ways to describe leadership. But if you start with the fact that you want to make the team better, you're probably headed in the right direction. But then you got to add and you said it yourself. You got to keep learning. As soon as you stop, you're done. I think you have to be humble. I do. If you're humble, you're approachable. If you're not. You're not, um, you got to be a sense maker, you know, all the, there's a, you know, you got to be, there's just a lot, you have to have character, you know, you have to be, I had, um, in Baghdad, when I was serving there, I had 52, um, Lieutenant Colonels commanding little battle groups all over the city. And at some point in time, I had, at the end of the tour, I had to kind of grade them to see which ones would go on to be promoted and, and take the next steps. And, you know, and some of them were happy with the grade and some of them were not. I tried to communicate consistently so they weren't surprised by it. But, you know, if you give somebody a bad grade, they're always going to say, wow, I didn't see that coming. Well, you weren't looking. <laughs> but anyway, um, and but I said to them, to some of them, I said, look, you had the best, you had the best maintenance records. You had the best training records. You know, you had this and this. But I said, you know, I used to wander around your unit and ask people, you know, who do you want to be like when you grow up? You know, who do you want to be like when you become this battalion commander? And it was never you. And I said, if if you as a leader are not um, insp- lighting the fire, I call it, or, or inspiring those, you know, who are junior to you, if they don't want to be like you someday, something's wrong. And that's that was the conversation that I had. And I really believe that if if uh, if you are the kind of person people want to be like, then you're you're a good leader. So before I let you go, I ask all my guests for some words of wisdom that either they receive that help them, that help guide them or that they want to pass along to others. General, what words of wisdom do you have to share? I've got this. How much time I got? I got. I need about 90 seconds. Can I have it? You got it. OK. When I was a division commander in Baghdad, I, uh, you know, we were obviously taking casualties and there's nothing harder on a military leader than when you begin taking casualties. And, you know, I mean, I struggled with it to try to figure out how to be a sense maker for everybody else, you know, who had lost their friends and, and teammates. 
And um, I came up with this phrase. I don't know how it happened, actually. I mean, it might have been divine. I, honestly, I, I don't know how it happened. But uh, as I would go to these memorial services, I would shake the hand of the soldiers who had survived whatever attack it was. And I'd say, make it matter. Just make it matter. You, you know, you can't you can't dwell on what's happened. You can't change what's happened, but you can make that sacrifice matter. So just make it matter. And so I have this box on my desk. I don't know if they, if you, can you see that? I can. Yeah, it says, and it's engraved, make it matter. And in there is this, is, are these cards, one for each soldier that I lost in that particular, most of them have a picture on it, a period of time. And there's 130, 20, 129 in here. I always have three in my wallet. And what I always try to do, Don, and especially when I was still serving and working as the chairman, is I tried to remember, you know, how much potential was in that box that was unrealized. You know, how many mothers and fathers, how many, how many senators and mayors and congressmen and teachers and wh whoever they were going to be, they didn't get a chance to fulfill their potential. So I'm going to do whatever I can to fulfill mine. I'm going to make it matter. And, and I don't think that's unique to the military. We can make it matter for your parents, your mentors, your coaches. But if you think every day I got to do something to make it matter, make today matter somehow. Write a note to somebody, pat somebody on the back, you know, be a good teammate, be a good person. If everybody, you know, started the day saying, OK, what am I do today to make it matter? I think we'd be a lot better off. Thank you, General. I am going to be a better leader and person because I've had you on uh, my podcast. So I appreciate you coming on. Um, do you have anything, anything that you would like to promote or plug? No. As we say goodbye. How about how about how about we we plug the fact that you know we we've got a lot to be, we got so many we're blessed we've got so many things to be thankful for, and we got to make sure that that everybody can have that same feeling about our country. And I don't think everybody does right now. So we can do a better job. Thank you, General. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Don. And thank you all so much for listening. Don't forget to follow NetLife with Dawn Staley on Apple Podcasts. Uh, subscribe on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. NetLife is produced by Just Women Sports. For more great sports content, go to JustWomenSports.com. Be sure to subscribe to the newsletter and YouTube channel and follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And this is Dawn Staley signing off and look forward to uh, having some great conversations. Before you see their scores... Hear their stories on the Flame Bearers podcast. Top women identifying athletes from around the world share their trials, triumphs, and full selves. With the Beijing Winter Paralympics underway, Flame Bearers' second season is live now and highlighting stories from U.S. figure skater Brady Tennell, ROC's Oksana Abdekarmanmova, and many more. Get ready for the Beijing games and listen to Flame Bears wherever you get your podcasts.